so let's have a look now at IPv6 and how this uh, functions. So the, the major features of IPv6 versus IPv4 uh, are 128 bit addresses. So this means that it has not four times the number of addresses of the 32 bit IPv4, but actually uh, it's uh, the number of addresses raised to the fourth power. So we're talking trillions and trillions and trillions of addresses rather than about 4 billion. Uh, it's way of handling multicast uh, is quite a bit more advanced than in IPv4 uh, and uh, it has features to support real-time service so flow labels and the like that can improve uh, routing speed uh, authentication and security so IPsec is effectively baked into uh, IPv6 uh, it improves uh, auto configuration compared to IPv4 so we don't have to have DHCP or bootp to do address provisioning uh, fragmentation is simplified. It can only be fragmented end to end, not uh, part way through uh, on any given hop. So this simplifies things. Uh, and it has some advanced functionality around uh, routing again to try and support both uh, global scale uh, and also mobile nodes. And there's actually quite a lot of things that were changed in IPv6 um, because they wanted to try and solve all of the problems with IPv4 uh, and it's a little ironic, uh, in doing so, they kind of suffered from what's known as the second system effect, where the first system is very simple uh, and effective, and the second system ends up a little bit overspecified and overcomplicated. Uh, and that combined with the fact that the address exhaustion of IPv4, which really was, was actually what was the driving reason uh, to increase the address space, uh, not to have a, a new internet version of the internet protocol, uh, was actually re largely relieved by about the time IPv6 came out uh, with this thing called Network Address Translation, NAT, uh, that we might talk about a little bit later uh, as we go through this course. Okay, so, um, so IPv6 uses, <coughs> pardon me, uh, classless address routing. Uh, so it doesn't have class A, class B or anything like that. Um, so that it can do, uh, more fine-grained allocation of address blocks. Uh, the notation is purposely different so that you can tell an IPv4 and an IPv6 address from one another. Um, you have eight blocks of 16-bit hex numbers. So 16 bits in hexadecimal requires four digits uh, to describe. Uh, and if you have ranges of zeros in the middle, which is not uncommon in an IPv6 address, uh, you can uh, compress them or summarize them by putting two colons and then everything between there is assumed to be zeros and the correct number of additional zeros put in to make the address complete. So here there are only three uh, address blocks. So you would need to have five blocks of a zero uh, in there. Uh, and so you can also express IPv4 addresses in an IPv6 compatible way uh, by having colon colon and then the IPv4 address. So this will put the IPv4 address, which is 32 bits, in effectively into these last two blocks and the rest of it will be leading zeros. Um, address assignment is a little bit different in IPv6 versus IPv4. Uh, again, to support uh, global scalability of routing, the address assignment is based on the provider uh, and on a geographic basis so that you can route addresses knowing from effectively, you know, which country or region or area uh, they're in. Uh, and this greatly simplifies uh, the job for routers, uh, particularly as the internet grows uh, with a number of devices by having, if you like, these implicit measures uh, of routing that can, uh, can help. Okay, so our addresses are longer than in IPv4, so this means that we need to have a bigger header. Uh, so the header is now 40 bytes instead of 20 bytes. Uh, and the variable option section of the IPv4 header has been uh, removed and instead, uh, there are flags that indicate whether or not there are certain specific uh, additional headers that follow uh, to make it a little bit more predictable. Uh, so the, the first four bits uh, of an IPv6 packet uh, indicate the version the same as it does on IPv4, but instead of having a four, uh, there's a six in here. Uh, then we have a traffic class and a flow label and this is designed to provide uh, faster routing and better quality of service with IPv6. Uh, then we have a 16-bit payload length, we have information on the next header, and we have information on the hop limit, uh, analogous to the, uh, the time to live 
uh, in IPv4. Then we have the source address and the destination address uh, of the packet. And they've stuck with having the source address first, even though the destination address is arguably more useful for routing. Um, on the basis that the flow label is supposed to enable the more efficient uh, routing with lower latency, uh, similar as we discussed with Ethernet. Okay, so that's the top level overview of IPv6. I'm now looking into some of the, uh, the things in this in more detail and in some of those in comparison with IPv4. Uh, so multicasting uh, in particular, so on IPv4 used class D addresses uh, and so that the multimedia backbone, the M bone, uh, kind of demonstrated the you know the, the functionality of this, uh, and uh, we can use uh, it uses tunneling uh, to push the traffic through. So IPv6 anticipated the increased need for multicast traffic on the internet, uh, for example, for video streaming, uh, internet radio, all of these sorts of things. Uh, and so it's an integral part of IPv6 rather than kind of a, an optional tack on. Uh, and the challenge was how they could try to make it scale. Uh, and so they're thinking about uh, two main groups of use cases, so one to many. So again, think internet radio station. It wants to broadcast information uh, to everywhere um, or indeed transmitting any other kind of news uh, or content uh, or even video streaming where everyone is watching a simulcast. Uh, software updates to multiple hosts, um, you know, on a, a local network perhaps. Uh, and then separate from that, we have many to many, where there's many producers of the traffic and many consumers. So, uh, you know, an, an online video conferencing call would be an example of that. Each participant has a camera and or microphone, uh, and every other participant needs to get the content from every other participant. Uh, online multiplayer games is another example where uh, you know the traffic is different but the need for everyone to uh, uh, to share data uh, is there um, or you might imagine some kind of distributed simulation where there's a bunch of nodes each doing part of the work uh, and coordinating so this might happen in a cloud environment where you might you know push a simulation into a, a cloud provider uh, and then they need a mechanism to uh, efficiently share uh, potentially large volumes of data between each of the uh, uh, the simulating uh, devices in there So if we don't have multicast, every source needs to send separate packets to every destination uh, to get the traffic through. Uh, and this clearly is suboptimal. And a big problem is that there is a big congestion point at every source point because they need to have you know, n times the traffic and n times the bandwidth uh, to talk to n devices. Uh, so multicast lets you send one packet instead of n. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, if you like, the secret source uh, of multicast. Uh, and the um, uh, a related challenge is that the source needs to know the IP address of every participant in order to uh, to facilitate that. But what if the group is dynamic? What if you have, uh, like with internet radio, right? You have many uh, people you know joining and leaving the stream on a regular basis. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the idea uh, was to create a mechanism to instead of unicast to one or broadcast to all, that you can do a many cast, a multicast. Uh, transmission that efficiently goes uh, to each of the um, uh, the participants and where the sender only has to say, I'm running this multicast group, uh, anyone who wishes to subscribe to it may. And so in IPv4, uh, the original multicast model is many to many. And so you have a multicast group uh, and each group uh, you know, has a single multicast uh, address, IP address, uh, and then members of a group uh, will each receive copies of whatever is sent to that group's multicast address. Uh, and so you can have multiple hosts in a group and you can have uh, hosts joining and leaving groups and uh, the consumers joining and leaving groups because everyone's kind of viewed uh, equivalently in that regard, that there's no master of the group, so to speak. Uh, so again, as we kind of said there, that the you know whoever is providing content in a multicast group then just sends a single copy of the packet. The destination address is the multicast uh, group address, uh, and it, it doesn't need to know how many there are. Uh, there might not be any consumers. It doesn't matter. The sending host just sends one packet. So just like doing a unicast stream, 
Um, except, of course, you can't do TCP on multicast because you have multiple consumers. Uh, how do you tell whether they've all received every packet and how would you do the retry and the hacking and you know you would end up with the um, uh, the fleet problem right where the fleet travels at the speed of the slowest boat uh, and so for video this would mean that if anyone had a congested link everyone's link would buffer this is bad uh, so generally multicast is used with uh, UDP based services so that you don't get that problem um, except for situations like software update where they might care much more about the reliable delivery than the uh, you know, then allowing it to pause now and then. Uh, but even then it becomes quite frustrating when everything pauses because you've got one flaky link that loses packets more often than the others. Uh, so that's all well and good. Um, now there's more of a focus on one-to-many multicast, recognizing that for most of the use cases of multicast, um, it is either naturally source specific uh, like an internet radio station, right? You have a single uh, you know, sender and many receivers. And even the ones that aren't naturally single source, uh, you can represent them effectively by having multiple single source. So a video call, conference call, for example, right? Each participant can create a multicast single source group for themselves and for the other participants. Uh, and that that you know, will effectively do the same job as having a, uh, a many source, a uh, many to many model. Uh, so there's multiple ways uh, to do this. Okay, and we'll continue that in the next video.